The second set in the Lower Wind Mini Block, Morning Tide, was released on the 1st of February 2008. With it came 148 new cards along with a pair of reprints. Boldwire Intimidator, first seen as a future shifted card in Future Sight, and Elvish Warrior, a card first introduced in Onslaught some six or so years prior. The story of Morning Tide can be experienced by reading the Morning Tide novel by Corey J. Herndon and Scott McGough. It picks up not too long after the events of the Mini Block's original novel, Lorwyn. And as usual, here's a summary of it all. Welcome to Storytime! The Eyeblight Elf, Rise, gets jumped by a band of elves that turn out to be the very same hunters he used to command. Thing is, it isn't Rise at all. Rather, it's Bridget, the Kithkin hero of the town of Kingsvale, in disguise. She's initially able to escape, only to find herself getting pummeled shortly thereafter. Meanwhile, the real Rise, along with the Mornsong Elf, Marlin, and Ashling, the Flamekin, are able to infiltrate the realm of the Goatleaf Elves and free the giant brothers, Brian and Keel, whom the elves are planning on turning into obedient, zombie-like entities known as Vinebread. Once they have their wits about them, the Vendillian clique of fairies who had been accompanying the party since pretty much the beginning convinces the brothers to take them all to see Rasheen, the giant's prophetic sister. Shortly thereafter, Ashling, whom had been suffering from anxiety and an overall feeling of worthlessness since her reignition, feels that she failed her true path by meeting with her destined elemental much too soon, as she was not yet ready for her ascension within her race. In short, she snaps, and, instead of guarding the giants and assisting the group, she goes off on her own, intent on hunting down and punishing the elemental for how she now feels. The merfolk, Sidge, who has been assisting the group with transport up and down Loren's waterways, decides it's best he departs as well so that he can look into some strange occurrences that have been happening recently amongst his kind. Bridget decides to accompany him. Not too long after their departure together, they find what Sidge was looking for by way of being attacked by a crazed member of Sidge's race. And another in their party, the sapling grown from the seed of the fallen tree folk sage, Colfenor, begins to wander, deciding that she should look for the recently departed Ashling. Indri, one of the fairies that make up the Vendillian clique, accompanies her. On the topic of Ashling, the Flamekin arrives at the place of her birth, Mount Tenefil. There, she is attacked by monks of the Emberfell Monastery for having an inappropriate ascension, instructing her that she must enter the order to make her ascension properly. Ashling, however, refused. In response, the monks animate an enormous stone giant to deal with her. Unexpectedly, and with great timing, Colfenor's sapling and Indri arrive, along with some flightless fairies they picked up along the way, and assist her in taking down the titan. Meanwhile, back with the remaining members of the original party, Rise and Marlin, Visa and Iliona, the two fairies who make up the rest of the Vendillian clique, begin to plot against Marlin tired of the Mornsong Elf constantly exerting authority over them. Shortly thereafter, the group finds Rasheen, asleep, and begin to figure out exactly how they're going to wake her up. Luckily, they don't necessarily need to. Thanks to some fey magic, they are able to witness some of the giant sages' visions for themselves. As they slumber and experience the show, something awakens within Marlin. As for Bridget and Sidge, they fight then run from the crazed merfolk. Just as they've managed to escape from the Mad Marrow, they run into another, and, thankfully, normal one. The three talk about the odd occurrences amongst their people, trying to figure out exactly what's going on. That's when their new acquaintance suddenly goes mad. Bridget and Sidge escape yet again and find themselves at the Paperfin School, whereupon it's discovered that the merfolk was once the mate of the school's leader, and he once bore the title heir to Morningtide. His former mate, however, is not exactly happy to see him, and orders his capture and execution. Sidge grabs an artifact he once possessed as heir, known as the Crescent of Morningtide, in hopes they can help cure whatever is ailing his kinsmen, and he and Bridget depart post-haste, the Kithkin taking hold of the merfolk's memento. Back with Rise and company, the Guildleaf Elves who have been tracking him finally catch up. The Eyeblight is then captured by his former second-in-command, Griffith. But before he could kill him, Griffith's recently assigned new commanding officer, Idrin, steps in. 
He provides Rise with a little background information about his traveling companion Marlin, stating that, in short, she is not the same Marlin who was accompanying his then bride-to-be when the wedding party was ambushed a while back. Rather, she is something else inhabiting the form of Marlin. Idrin then offers Rise a place once again within the guilt leaf in exchange for his obedience. As this is happening, the giant, Brian, awakens and notices his eye-blight friend is missing. The giant follows some nearby tracks and discovers Rise in the hands of the very same elves who had previously attacked them. Thinking he's helping his eye-blight friend, the giant attacks a contingent of elves. And before Rise can accept Idrin's offer of reinstatement, Brian attacks and pretty much destroys the entire guilt leaf contingent, save for Idrin, who is able to evade the giant's attacks. Between blows, the High Elf throws a vial of Moonglove poison into the giant's mouth, suffocating him as the fatal poison takes hold. Rise then finally accepts Idrin's offer of reinstatement in the Guildfleet Society. That's when Marlin shows up. She does away with what's left of Idrin's soldiers before exiling Idrin himself from the scene. Meanwhile, all around them, the world begins to turn dark. An event known as the Great Aurora is occurring as the world of Lorwyn begins to become twisted as the centuries-long pleasantness of the plains daytime set in motion by the Queen of the Fae, Una, begins to finally transition into a dark and vicious nighttime. Meanwhile, Ashling, having finally agreed to allow the ritual to take place, was faced with the shadowy reality of a world of disfigured feral flamekin. Her destiny, as it turns out, was to become a vessel to bring the flamekin fire safely into this new darker world by uniting with the greater elemental and Kalfoner sapling, who bears the ancient wisdom of Kalfoner himself, just as the late ancient Yu had planned. Ashling, however, was tired of being used for the plans of others. In the mere seconds of transition in which the two worlds, that of Lorwyn and Shadowmoor, coexist, she seizes control, forcibly absorbing the elemental into herself as the sapling burns, some of the power from the enchanted fire transferring to Marlin by way of the young tree folk. As for Marlin, it's discovered that she, indeed, wasn't Marlin at all, and hasn't been since the fateful day of the wedding party's ambush. Instead, Una had used her corpse as an avatar of sorts for herself in order to store her memories in the event that the upcoming Great Aurora would affect her just as it does most all other creatures on the plane. Marlin, now knowing all that Una knows, gleefully accepts the plane's new reality. Rise, meanwhile, goes to locate Idrin and rejoin the Guilt Leaf. Bridget, who holds Sidge's Crescent of Morningtide, sees the changes occurring around her, including that of her Murfo companion, but finds herself unaffected by the change. And Ashling, Well, her flame has never burned brighter, and this new, dark world is all but hers to ignite. Thus ends not just the plot of Lorwyn slash Morningtide, but the plane of Lorwyn as well, as both the story and location morph into the near-eternal night of Shadowmoor. Spooky. Thankfully, there's still more to talk about in terms of Morningtide as a Magic the Gathering set. Let's get on with it. Morningtide expanded upon Lorne's flavor and themes by way of shifting the focus away from tribal identity of its predecessor's eight races and towards the five classes this new set focuses on. Rogues, Shamans, Soldiers, Warriors, and Wizards. The shtick of Morningtide was we started caring about classes. So this set had a class theme, so there were still there were still cars that cared about the races, but layered into that was cars that cared about the classes. Um, that ended up being a very elaborate net of things. That having eight races and five classes all interwoven together uh, got really, really complicated on the board. The set also has a number of cards that care about plus one, plus one counters. Despite the partial departure from Lorwyn's themes, the clash and evoke mechanics that were introduced in the set return and join three new mechanics that make their debut in Morningtide. Prowl. 
which is an alternate cost to play a spell and may be used if you've dealt combat damage to a player with a creature that shares a type with the card that has Prowl. For example, Thieves' Fortune, a rogue tribal instant, can be cast for just one blue mana, rather than blue and two, so long as you've dealt combat damage to a player with one of your rogue creatures. Kinship, which is a keyword ability that allows you to look at the top card of your library at the beginning of your upkeep, and, should it share a creature type with a creature with the kinship ability, you reveal it and get to do an effect. An example of this can be seen on the card Nightshade Schemers, which, if you reveal a fairy or wizard, each opponent loses two life. And, Reinforce which is an activated ability you can play from your hand and lets you put plus one plus one counters equal to the card's reinforced number. The card Burrington Bombardier, for example, has reinforced two and, thusly, places two plus one plus one counters onto a target creature. In addition to these three new mechanics, Morning Tide also features a whopping 11 cycles, which is a lot considering the set's small size. Most notable amongst these are Tribal Equipment, one for each of Morning Tide's five classes, such as the card Thornbite Staff, caring about the Shaman creature type. Bannerets, each of which being a two-drop creature that reduces the casting cost of its two related creature types. Bali Rush Banneret, for example, is a two-one for one and a white, and reduces Kithkin and Soldier spells by one generic mana. Clashback spells, all of which feature the Clash ability from Lorwyn and return to your hand should you win the Clash and plus one plus one tribal lords, each of which provides plus one plus one counters for incoming creatures of each specific type, and can use those counters for a beneficial purpose, such as seen on the card Una's Blackguard, which can force your opponent to discard a card each time they're dealt combat damage by a creature with a plus one plus one counter on it. Morning Tide also has one mirrored pair in the cards Mind Shatter and Mind Spring, with the former causing card discard and the latter causing card draw. The cards are, essentially, rebalanced versions of the OG magic cards Mind Twist and Brain Geyser, respectively. As for other notable cards found within the set, Morning Tide has a small assortment. Bitter Blossom, a dominant card for fairy strategies when the Loran Shadowmoor blocks were in standard. The card is still considered a powerful inclusion today and can be found in competitive decks across EDH and Legacy. I designed this card. Um, this was inspired, there's a card called Frexian Arena, uh, where every turn you, you pay a life and draw a card. And I was just interested, um, I, I just wanted to make another Frexian Arena. I'm like, okay, that Frexian Arena was a kind of a cool card. Okay, well, every turn you pay a life, what can you get? And I'm like, how about a fairy? Uh, and it turns out uh, paying a life to get a fairy is mighty strong. So this was a very, very strong card, but, but a fun card and flavorful. Marlin of the Morn Song, which is a combo piece in certain EDH decks. Moodavolt, considered one of the best and most versatile man land How you doing? cards in the game. Still today, the card sees inclusion in Pioneer, Legacy, and Modern decks, thanks to its changeling, this creature is all creature types, ability. So this was, there's a card uh, from Antiquities called Mishra's Factory, which taps for colorless, and then you could activate it to make it a 2-2 creature. Um, we were trying to do a fixed version of uh, Mishra's Factory. Now Mishra's Factory allows you to tap it to give plus one plus one to target Mishra's Factory. Um, this one doesn't do that. Um, so we, we thought by removing that, but oh, instead we'll give it the changeling ability was weaker than being able to grant a creature plus one plus one. And so apparently even not being able to make itself bigger, um, Mutavolt went on to be a very powerful card. Release the Ants, a clashback spell that can finish games in your favor should you have the right spell on top of your deck. Revelark, which was the backbone of the competitive red-white boat brew deck that made top eight at Pro Tour Kyoto in 2009. It's just a, a deck that constantly puts, in, puts things on the board and uh, is, is constantly just like getting incremental advantage against your, your opponent. Like, it's just one of the best incremental advantage decks ever. Scapeshift, a key card found in Modern that pairs extremely well with the Zendikar card Valakut, the Molten Pinnacle. And Vendillion Click, a tournament quality card that, while not in as widespread use as it used to be, can still be found in competitive EDH and Modern decks here and there. So this is a bend in blue, to be, to be kind of, a big bend in blue. 
Um, really, this is a discard card. Um, normally, we would do discard in black. Now, this card went on to be a very powerful... I mean, it, to this day, it's still played in any, in fact, any format that can play this card. Uh, there are decks that play this card. It's a very powerful card. While they're not going down a card, the fact that you're getting rid of a card that matters, you know, most of the time, if I make you get rid of your best card, you're not going to draw a card as good as that card. Also, the pre-release promo for Morning Tide is an alternate art foil of the card Door of Destinies, itself a popular tribal inclusion in EDH. A special foil Earwig Squad served as the set's release promo. Could be worse. So is Morning Tide one of your favorite Magic the Gathering sets? Love it or hate it? Let us know your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, and if you'd like to support Magic Untapped's content, please remember to subscribe here on YouTube, and please toss a buck in our tip jar on Patreon.